This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. One. Bingo! We're here. We're back. It's Wednesday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And this is, let me do this carefully. This is Mina, Marco, and me, San Mina. She's not here. But Marco is here in the flesh, in the studio. We love that. Welcome to your show, Marco. Well, the sign says there, thanks for having me on the show. So that's something I can read. And uh, <laughs> my eyesight is not poor enough. Uh, I mean, this is really a treat to be able to have you, bet. you two times in a week. Yeah, this is fabulous. <laughs> I can only hope we'll find something to talk about. Oh, uh, why do I feel we will? We can, we will. So let's see, what are we talking about? Let's talk about energy, Marco. The first thing is let's talk about solar power that you brought back from Tibet. Solar energy, of course, keeps the planet going, causes things to be green. Uh, without it, we would be one sorry species, right? So I thought in honor of your continuing fight, fighting the good fight on behalf of us uh, in Hawaii and all sentient beings, that I would present you with this little token, you know, formally initiating you into the practicing prayer wheeled club of, <laughs> of Hawaii. And this is a solar powered prayer wheel. It is from Lhasa, Tibet. And this is the solar cell right here. So as it's pointing out towards the sun, it does not need direct sun. In other words, diffuse sun will do it. You can put it on your car dash. Uh -huh. This little wheel actually does spin as it's doing now. Uh -huh. And there are actually teeny tiny prayers inside. And as the, uh, the Buddhists in Tibet and places like Bhutan and other places believe that as it spins round and round, it sends its prayers to the heavens for the benefit of all sentient beings. So congratulations. Oh, no, You're the thank first, you, the Marco. You're the first initiate A beautiful here thing. In, in downtown Honolulu. So you are going to hopefully start a trend. Yeah, well, I know that they're all going to be envious. They're going to be stopping me on the street, congratulating me about, you know, and being envious at the same time. I will find a, a treasured place for this, Marco. Well, you are most welcome. Great statement of energy, a perfect gift, perfect. But let's go further than that. Leave it there. Yes. Let's go further than that. Let's talk about solar in general. So much is happening. You sent me an article from the Wall Street Journal a few days ago. It really left a tattoo kind of impression on my thinking about where solar is going. You want to summarize that? Sure. Uh, in fact, I, I've been engaged in a bit of a dialogue with that reporter just in the past uh, handful of hours. Russell Gold, he writes out of Texas, and he's one of the energy writers for the journal. And uh, that specific piece was looking at utility scale storage, battery storage, and specifically how it is offsetting the need to run uh, what are known as peaker plants or peak demand plants. So if you can provide peak demand, if you can satisfy the peak electricity demand in a service territory with batteries rather than running fossil fuel at a cost effectively. Now cost effective of course is, is critical because as I've said for, for a number of years it's not renewables at all costs, it's cost effective renewables. Yes. So if the batteries can be charged by renewable energy rather than let's say fossil fuels then that reduces the demand for Peaker plants, which are typically more expensive, uh, less efficient, to be able to meet some utility demands, and that's only we have one here. A peaker we, plant. We have a peaker plant yeah. in Kapolei. Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. I've walked it. We had an OC16 show about that yeah. plant. Yeah. Hawaiian Electric. It's beautiful. High tech. Yeah. Brand new. Well, it's not brand new. A few years old. But relatively speaking, it's brand new, and it does exactly what you said. It. 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 It ups the game at the critical hours of the day when it's necessary. And then it's not necessary after that, so it comes down again. So we're beginning to see a number of kind of path-breaking utilities in our state and also on the mainland that are moving forward with these larger scale storage plans and integrating them into their networks. So it is, it is certainly a, um, a work in progress. We're not, we haven't hit any type of critical mass by any means in terms of mass deployment of storage. and. It's a real challenge on the part of the utilities to try to determine what ideally is the best mix. And we're, 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 again, we're going where, where no utilities have gone before in this state in terms of trying to figure out what the best mix of utility scale renewables is along with rooftop 
solar along with utility scale storage at substations, let's say power plants, and also much smaller scale storage at people's homes. And how is it all going to mesh together, work properly to create an interactive, interdependent, resilient grid that we all aspire to see? And as we've talked about, I think, earlier this week with Mina, the, one of the examples that has kind of blown away a lot of us uh, is Puerto Rico and the fact that that's an island that suffered beyond uh, serious devastation. Puerto Rico is the ghost of Christmas future. The ghost of Christmas future, yeah, and the fact that now five plus months after Hurricane Maria, there's still 30, 40 percent of the population that don't have a reliable access to power. Yeah. Four, five months later. So are we in a precarious, uh, as precarious situation? Oh, I mean, Hawaiian Electric will say, no, 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 Ron Cox, who's one of the VPs, their senior VPs at Hawaiian Electric, did a piece uh, and the advertiser in the past couple months uh, saying, you know, we're, we're watching this very carefully and we're not as, as much at risk well, he is watching as it. Puerto Rico. He, he spoke at the <clears throat> National Disaster Preparedness Training Center meeting in Waikiki two weeks ago. We saw him. We have footage of him um, speaking. And he, he cares a lot about that. I think he's like the designated person at Hawaiian Electric to care about that. And, and he's got some good ideas. You know, the question really is, is, is unknowable until something happens. And, um, you know, something is likely to happen pretty soon because we have climate change um, and we have El Nino coming this summer. Um, and we have, I call it the, you know, uh, it's kind of a random analysis <clears throat> of, uh, we have not had a path of a major hurricane come through Honolulu yet. So that means the chances of one coming through Honolulu now, right, the chances are greater. Anyway, so if that happens to Honolulu, we're going to find out, you know, how well prepared we really are. Right. Well, I know this is on the Hawaiian Electric roadmap, and uh, another one of their VPs, Bob Eisler, uh, is uh, kind of heading up there, as I understand it, heading up their efforts uh, in terms of looking at battery storage and where it's going to de de be deployed first, how it's going to be deployed, how much is going to be deployed. So it's really a, a fascinating time from those of us in the trenches as solar contractors homeowners who have yet to go solar who are looking at batteries, the utilities that are looking to deploy it as it makes sense. I mean, KIUC being the leader in the state so far in terms of deploying. And David Bissell spoke and, and Bissell, yesterday. Uh, my friend David Bissell, uh, you know, has really been the captain, you know, great captain of the KIUC ship. They have one PV plant that will be going in with storage uh, in addition to the existing one with Tesla, Solar City. Tesla exists. But that's, that's already AES up. AES is going in. Right, right. But he's also building pumped hydro, yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, he's way mm -hmm. ahead on this whole notion of storage, however you frame it, with uh, photovoltaic. And he's not doing wind. It's, they had a bird environmental problem, and right. I guess they have, they have people in Kauai who don't want to do that. So there is no wind on Kauai. There won't be any wind on Kauai. And, you know, you talked about the evolution of the, the mix, so to speak. Well, the evolution on Kauai is real simple. Um, it's, it's photovoltaic and storage. Although they have a certain amount of bagasse going on, you know, they have- the, They're still burning bagasse? Yeah, they, well, they have, a, I'm not sure that's the right word for this. This is agricultural product. Mm -hmm. They cut down the trees, they, uh, you know, junk trees and-, and Right, and, yes, it's not bagasse as far as I know, because I don't think there's any commercial cane on that island okay, left. Okay, it wouldn't I mean, be bagasse, but yeah. it would be an agricultural right, material. Right, biomass. Biomass, right, thank you, right. biomass. And they have the big factory there. We saw it, we filmed it, we made an OC-16 show out of that too. Right. And um, that's, a, that's really going great guns. They burn it and, um, at, from the heat. Um, they have a turbine that creates uh, power, and they send the power to K. Yeah, you see, the contractor has this. It's quite a big facility. Right. And I, I can't give you the numbers and how, how much percentage of the total, but it's, it's part of their mix for sure. Well, but I suggest to you, though, as in Kauai, this whole thing is going to evolve into photovoltaic and, and storage. And we're seeing that... Uh with the recent announcement last week uh, uh, with Hawaiian Electric, Miko, and uh, Half Moon uh, Ventures in Chicago, we talked about you and I and Mina on, on Monday, that this plant on Molokai, which needs regulatory approval, permit approval, all the logistics have to fall into place uh, in a relatively short order, even though we're, we're only in February 2019, 2018, excuse me, 
uh, they have to get it up and operational more or less by the end of next year. So this would be to get the tax credit to get the tax credits, right? They're also tapping into uh, the so-called new market tax credits with Pono, Pono Shim. Uh, that's a big part of the equation. So they're, from what I can tell, they're, they're leveraging the tax credits to the hilt in order to pull this off. But if they're able to do it, bring it online, it's a very big leap for Hawaiian Electric to do this. So it's a, Molokai is a small service territory, about 3,000 customers there. And it's got one power plant and one power plant fossil only. Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. So if you can turn that island to close to 100% renewable or, or certainly you know, 90-ish percent with one solar plant and one battery, that's, that's really a big deal. So I'm yeah. very pleased that Hawaiian Electric and Half Moon were able to come to, to terms on this. And since it's a power purchase agreement, it means that the risk from Hawaiian Electric's perspective, I think, is is less than if they were to own the assets themselves. That's a harder slog, and Hawaiian Electric has shown over the years to be somewhat averse to actually owning utility-scale PV generation. That's exactly what David Bissell said yesterday at the Harvard Club. It's better to have the contractor yeah. own it, because the contractor is expert in this sort of thing, yeah. and he, he's the one who installed it, so let him manage it, and you, you pay for his management, but it's okay, because you're going to get a better product that way. Yeah. Well, and Hawaiian Electric, uh, I believe they have received approval or are about to get approval to issue out uh, requests for proposals for across their service territories for multi, multi megawatts of renewable energy, which most likely will be third party owned with them, the third parties proposing contracts of multi year duration at a, at a favorable rate for all the ratepayers. It'd be great if we could collectively get enough uh, of these PPAs nailed down where the price of electricity would plateau. And ideally, ideally, without being an economist, I don't know how re real this is, to be able to start a downward trend. I mean, that would be truly remarkable. I don't know how likely that is. But that the article talked about that. Didn't yeah. it? it talked about the peaking plant <clears throat> for a kilowatt hour um, and this would this be higher than the average of what they are charging people, but it was like 87 cents for a kilowatt hour during peaking, by, by virtue right. of the peaking plant. And it was way less, it was, I forget exactly what, it was in the 30s or something for the storage and battery affair. Um, but you've got to get less than that. And the question I want to put to you is we have two factors going on. One is it's the termination of these tax credits. Um, you know, both, uh, well, both of the federal tax credits are going to expire sometime. And query whether in this administration they're going to be renewed or not. The administration is not so interested in renewables and environmental issues as, as earlier administrations. And the second thing is, you know, we get the tariff. This administration put the tariff on photovoltaics. Those two factors work against, you know, this dream result of having, um, you know, PV and storage all over the country. I'm reluctant to go too far down the road in terms of forecasting. What you said is absolutely correct that when you have uh, the hint of a trade war perhaps brewing and it, it increased cost of photovoltaic modules coming into the country, that's certainly not a good thing. But at the same time, the numbers that I've seen so far show the, the increase in photovoltaic modules to be rather nominal when it comes to the entire cost of the installed system. I mean, it's not going to go down certainly, but it's going to be more an incremental increase. So. The Solar Energy Industries Association, or SIA for short, based in, in Washington, was forecasting a job loss of, I think, 24,000 if these were to be approved. This was prior to uh, the White House decision. Uh, how hyperbolic that is, I really don't know. Clearly, if you're trying to fight against something, you want to play up the boogeyman nature of it. But it's certainly not, not a positive thing. And uh, 2017 saw in the biggest market in the country, which is for solar, which is California, saw the number of new installs go down for the first time in years and years. Now, part of that is weather related because California was socked first part of 2017 with torrential rains. And now, go figure now that it's kind of on the flip side of that. It's, it's not drought conditions, mm -hmm. but a lot less rain. Mm -hmm. So there's just so much at play. Yeah. Well, one thing is, one thing is clear is that this is becoming a national issue. These, these questions are being raised nationally in many states, many cities. And when we come back from this break, Marco, I'd like to talk to you about where companies like Nextera fit 
uh, whether there'll be another merger or acquisition in our future somehow because of these national trends. And uh, I'd also like to talk to you about one thing you raised earlier, and that is the need to have a mix between utility scale solar and you know, single family or single building solar, um, and how that fits with the need to bury the power lines underground Okay, in the case of disaster. Oh, wow. We'll never finish. Big bucks. Big bucks. We'll be right yeah. back after this break. Yeah. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their. We're, we're back with Marco Mangelsdorf here on Mina, Marco, and me, San Mina. We. <laughs> we. <laughs> <laughs> Little French never hurt anybody. And we're talking about energy, of course. It's so interesting to, you know, and thank you again for being in the studio with, with us, Marco. My great pleasure, Jay. Yeah. So some of these leftover questions, there's about a million of them. But, uh, you know, we have, we have national trends going on. I mean, you know, go back a few years ago, Hawaii was like the only one on the, on, on the, on the screen. We were, you know, a leader and uh, we were an icon. And everybody wanted to see what we were doing. Now, a lot of places, and the article that you sent me, Wall Street Journal article talked about NextEra, and NextEra was was doing big time, big developments in solar and battery. You know, we worried about that during the approval process. People didn't think they would do that. Well, they are doing it, and they're doing it outside the state of Florida. They're doing it in other states and other cities, and they've gone national. And that seems to be, you know, uh, it seems to be consistent with the national trend here. We're doing bigger, and we're doing national with national actors. And I wonder how that affects Hawaii and whether Nextera or somebody else will be back. Nextera still has a lingering interest here and maybe a future interest. Um, what's going to happen? Oh, well, as far as them being back, uh, I don't have any in inside information on that. I mean, uh, both Hawaiian Electric Industries and, and Nextera gave it the old college try and then some in an effort to, uh, to have Hawaiian Electric be purchased by Nextera and that uh, failed due to a regulatory decision and uh, there's no doubt that the Hawaiian Electric Board gave very careful, 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 one more careful, careful consideration about moving in that direction with NextEra Energy out of Florida and it was a, uh, this is, was all part of the discovery process on that docket. Yeah, and, right. And my, uh, Hawaii, you followed that. You were into The Hawaii Island right? Energy Cooperative was a uh, intervener on the docket, yeah. so I was reading quite a bit of that intel. And they came to the conclusion that it was going to be a good move for the company, good move for the shareholders, good move for the state of Hawaii. And it was the rolling of the dice, which they believed was uh, standing at pretty high odds of being able to, to, to win the big prize, right? And it didn't happen. And uh, that was a tremendous amount of effort on Hawaiian Electric's part, next year's part. So the appetite that Hawaiian Electric may or may not have to roll that dice again, I, I'm not privy to, but it, it took a lot for them to get to the point to roll the dice with NextEra, which was a, a bold, innovative. It was indeed, I agree. As far as utilities go, company uh, on the mainland. It was an avant-garde move. And you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, part of that Wall Street Journal piece is that NextEra is doing a project in, in Tucson uh, with uh, storage that is going to be a path-breaking project. So NextEra is living up to their, their reputation of being a more progressive utility company or, more, or, or utility group. Uh, as far as them getting back in the action here, uh, I can't comment on that as I think we've talked about uh, kind of in passing. It was interesting to see that you know, for the Colleen Hanabusa, her governor campaign, the two of her uh, contributors, because it's all public knowledge, of course, uh, Eric Gleason, who led the charge here for Next Era, and who I got a chance to know and have a lot of respect and love for, and his boss Jim Robo, who's the CEO, they both contributed the maximum amount to the Colleen Hanabusa for governor campaign of 6000 a pop. And uh, is that some indication they're interested in getting back 
here, or is it just a way of giving their uh, friendly salute to a governor, Governor David Ige, who was demonstrably opposed? Mm, I to, recall. To, yeah, yeah, you yeah. recall that. Yes, yeah. I do as well. So, I think it's going to be um, my my channeling the Hawaiian Electric Industries Board, which my, my insight into that is extremely, extremely limited. Uh, it would be rather extraordinary if they were to find another suitor, I think, who would come up with a juicier package that would stand a better chance of being able to get regulatory approval, especially in light of the approximate year and a half of Oh, that was such a hassle for Nextera. Yeah. yeah. And they were treated, you know, with a lot of disrespect, may I add. Um, but anyway, um, but there is, you agree with me, though, I mean, and this is the implication of the article, is these are national trends. These companies are doing projects way outside their, uh, you know, original uh, geographical er areas. Yeah. Um, and we're going to see, uh, consolidation may not be the right word, but we're going to see national events, national developments taking place, no? No, undoubtedly. I mean, uh, storage is, uh, when store energy storage was being hyped and, and, and fawned over, two or three years ago, I thought, oh, here's just yet another hot topic that people can get all excited about that has a lot more uh, smoke than actual fire. Well, the, the, the smoke has been going on long enough that there is actual fire there now a couple, three years later in terms of who's in the market. Tesla, based in the U.S. with Elon Musk and, and, and the superstar that he is and and you Rocket know, it's great man. that Rocket man. Falcon, Falcon Heavy <laughs> launched, and, and, and you know, he said prior to the launch, he said it's either going to be one heck of a, of a launch or it's going to be a heck of a, of a fireworks show, as in blowing up on the launch pad. So Spaceman made it up, and it's on its way. Actually, I hear the trajectory is that they were a little bit off. They're not going to get to Mars, but they're going to shoot past Mars uh, into the so-called asteroid belt. So uh, the point being is that you have major players, whether it's Tesla, LG Chem out of uh, South Korea, Samsung out of South Korea, uh, Sonnen out of Germany, Mercedes-Benz out of Germany. And if you look at the largest battery f making facilities of this type of battery in the world, according to Bloomberg, number one is the Gigafactory outside of Reno, but then there are eight or nine Gigafactory-like scaled plants that are going in in China and in South Korea. So. Where is all this product going to go? It's got to go somewhere. These people who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these production facilities aren't doing it because they think it's going to no, sit on the shelf. No. And, right? and further, you know, it's likely with the new technology, um, it's likely to be cheaper or at least yeah. cheap enough to be competitive against fossil fuel. So th this could be the best time we ever had. But let me ask you this question. <clears throat> you referred to it earlier. It's the mixed question between utility-scale solar, which seems so efficient, um, and rooftop solar for you know, smaller residences and buildings. Um, we're, we're still, the, the jury's out on which way is best. The mix is not yet established. Hawaii will learn more about this going forward. But one of the elements is uh, suppose we have a storm, because the storm is not gonna knock off the battery. The right. storm is gonna knock down the, the poles. Right. And if the poles knock down, you really wish you had something on your roof. And I don't know how that plays, but I wonder what your thought is about it. Well, you know, full disclosure, my company is a Tesla energy dealer. So we have been installing. In fact, I installed one of their power walls on my very own home. Uh, and I've had a net metered system now for the past several years. So is it working okay for you? It's working fantastic. Mm. And I've tested it in a simulated grid outage. And uh, it provides, I, I don't use a whole lot of power, but it provides power for my entire home. So it's backup for the entire home, which I think is a, a substantial retrofit market for companies like mine to be able to offer the 80 some odd thousand net energy metered customers across the state uh, backup battery retrofit in order to provide that resiliency and redundancy. And you can't make a ROI, return on investment argument, because it doesn't produce power, it stores power. Yeah. But you look at it from the perspective of we're the most insured we've ever been as a species. We pay for car insurance and health insurance and life insurance and liability this insurance, insurance pet insurance, 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 insurance. So are we at a point now where there are going to be more and more homeowners that will be thinking, does it make sense to pay an insurance policy to have the security and peace of mind of battery storage in case the grid goes down? Now, if you had asked the people in Puerto Rico last July 
that, they would have, no, nah, I'm not worried about hurricanes wiping out the well, island for four months. If people here, they would say the same thing, right? Right, right. <laughs> so there's nothing like a, an adverse weather event to get things top of mind awareness. And I, I brought back to the, the, the image that you've probably seen of Hurricane Aniki 26 years ago. It went in a, a lateral line south of the Big Island, almost straight line south of South Point, and then made, much to everybody's surprise, a sharp 90 degree right hand turn straight up and blasted the Garden Isle. So when is the next one going to hit? You don't know, I don't know, we don't know. But we're in a more sensitive uh, part of the world in terms of those type of events. So mm -hmm. having more storage deployed, uh, deployed strategically with a mix of utility scale solar, rooftop solar, will do nothing but increase the interdependence, independence as well of the individuals who, or companies that put storage on. And also I think over time lead to a greater resiliency and redundancy of, of the grid to be able to stay on during adverse events. But we truly, Jay, we're truly going where no utilities have gone before on this kind of scale. So you gotta, you know, take our hats off to folks like David Bissell and KIUC and the folks at Hawaiian Electric that have a bunch of smart people who are really dedicated and want, we all want the same thing, more renewables, get to 100% in a cost-effective way sooner rather than later, have us be less dependent on these long supply lines of oil and other fossil fuels coming from great And great more businesses. security. More security, right, right. So to have security, it seems to me that, you know, the uh, underscore here is to have security, you really need to have both. You know, you, your house, for example, just take it as an example, um, it, it, it will go indefinitely off the grid, indefinitely. Yes. Um, and uh, most houses don't have that. Uh, right. You've got to have both uh, the PV and, and the battery. And I, and I think, you know, people don't understand it. If you took a survey right now, people would say, I'm fine the way it is. I'm not going to change anything, including the people who are on the grid but have PV on their roof without a battery. Um, and after El Nino, after whatever happens this summer or the summer after that, um, maybe that's going to change. In the end, I suggest to you that we will have both. Why? It's going to cost more, but we will have both because of security. Right. And the price of batteries will go down. There's no doubt about that. I think it's going to be more gradual rather than off the cliff decrease in prices. And, you know, the typical adoption curve is you get the first adopters who are willing to be the first ones out there. And then they talk to their neighbors and they talk to their family and they're pleased with being able to have that. Plus, I gotta, gotta say that the, uh, the app that Tesla came up with, which uh, I'm not big on apps, not at all. The cell phone uh, app. It's, it's on your, you, in your cell phone, you can see as long as you have uh, internet access, wherever you happen to be in the world, you can see how your system is operating. And for a wonk, techie guy like me, to be able to see what my solar produced yesterday, what my battery do, how much did it offset uh, my uh, utility usage? I mean, it's, it's really way cool. So I think there's that part of us that are uh, the consumer, which uh, some don't give a darn about that kind of stuff, but a lot of people, the ones that I've come across so far, think it's, it's really cool. So, and that's, you know, got to hand it to Elon Musk that uh, and he has, of course, no shortage of detractors, but he, he's on to something. He's on to some really cool things, some really yeah. big things. Yeah. And as I uh, shared with my students when I taught uh, UC Santa Cruz last year, uh, companies like Tesla, they're not selling near-term, uh, short-term profitability. He is selling hope for the future. Vision. And that's, that's kind of short in supply sometimes. And that, and that points out one bottom line point that I think we have to always keep in our minds, that technology is, is getting more disruptive. There'll be bigger, better technology. People can copy that app, or at least the functionality of it. There'll be another app, there'll be another idea, who knows, with artificial intelligence. So this is all going to get better, more efficient, and hopefully cheaper. Thank you so much, Marco. We're you know, you're in great the, on the in phone, the free world. but you're even better in person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you this for that. This will be spinning, spinning, <laughs> uh, sending all powerful, positive messages for all sentient beings. I feel On it. On your dash. I feel it. Whoa! <laughs>